Today we're going to talk about building an AppSec program. So <clears throat> again, I work for, I do AppSec lead for, I'm the AppSec lead for Oracle NetSuite. This is how big NetSuite is. They're a, kind of an ERP CRM type tool. Um, they have some other brands that they've bought that do different things, but this is kind of the mothership, what's going on. There's about, uh, this, these numbers are a little dated, but these are the public numbers. Uh, I would say that's probably grown by 60%, 70% since then. Um, so we're bigger, more money, all that kind of thing in the last couple of years. Uh, but there's no new published numbers since Oracle's bought them because they went from being a public company to now being part of Oracle. So I've done um, dev and security work kind of back and forth for essentially my whole career. Um, on the side, I do quite a bit of OWASP stuff. So we'll talk about a few tools today that hopefully you haven't heard of before. Um, if anything, you may have heard of, anybody heard of AppSensor before? Yes. Two, three, awesome. Uh, so that's mine. Um, and I've been with OWASP uh, Actually, the very first thing I did for OWASP was way back when. Anybody know Mark Curfee? Remember Mark, like the guy that started OWASP way back when? Um, I was still in college and I was taking a security class trying to figure out what security was. Uh, and I basically did like, a, uh, like an English paper review of his first guide, but somehow got credited. So I've been at OWASP forever, basically, since it started. Uh, so thank you all for being here. I know there's interesting talks going on. I appreciate you being in this room. Um, so to help tailor the talk a little bit for me, how many people, I'm assuming everybody has something to do with security? Yes? It's the last time I'll ask you to raise your hands, I hope. Um, something to do with dev? <laughs> awesome. Uh, more interested in either tech or program side of it. Tech? Program? Awesome. Half and half. Beautiful. So uh, I'll try to talk twice as fast so we cover everything. Um, so we have, what, around 50 minutes, yeah? Uh, I think I've got 110 slides, so it, it's gonna go quick. Um, I am from North Carolina, so talking fast is not like Menino fast. If you were in his talk yesterday, you won't get that from me, but I'll do my best. So this talk is gonna be about the, about two years of starting up a program at a shop that you would kind of characterize of what you've heard a lot of the last two days, DevOps, microservices, this was that kind of a shop. <clears throat> uh, so there was an existing security program at the mothership, but they didn't really know what to do with the brand because they bought this group and they were a different development style, so they had a new security person, or needed a new security person and they needed a new type of security program. So this is, um, what we're going to talk about, I'll try to be as honest as possible. Um, a couple caveats, I never talk about commercial tools in my talks. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Just by policy, I don't talk about commercial tools. Um, I'm happy to bash or um, you know, say good things about them later. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to try to focus on applicability, which will come mostly at the end. And then what I would do if I had to do it all over again. So I came into this thing and I had worked for a security products company and uh, I was not sure. I, I wanted a new challenge of starting a security program and I figured, well, okay, maybe this will work. <laughs> um, so I'm interested when, uh, when you submit to these, to give these talks, uh, it's always interesting to see the people that you're talking beside. So there've been some really impressive talks. So the fact that I get to talk about this is, is pretty clever, but uh, the way I thought about solving that problem is, right, you're all very smart, you're very smart at what you do, probably a lot better than I am, but, you know, nobody can tell me what my story is, so I'm going to do a story and that way you can't tell me I'm wrong. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of story time. So this is my role for y'all. Uh, I don't know if everybody remembers this. This was the guy who was teaching about gun safety to kids and shot himself in the foot in the process. So I'm going to try to do this for you. I started a security program at a place that didn't have one. And I tried to learn a lot of lessons. I shot myself in the foot quite a few times. I'm going to try to help you all avoid this. Um, having said that, context really, really, really matters. Some of the things I'm going to say today will not apply at all. Some of them you're going to have to tweak, right? I don't know your business and you don't necessarily know mine. So take everything you hear with a grain of salt. I'll try to give you, uh, I'm not a big believer in best practices because, you know, your environment may be fundamentally different. Um, so having said that, this is my context. 
There was a company in the middle um, here, which is more traditional, more monolith style. Uh, they had bought a smaller startup company that was more DevOps, microservices, that world. Um, and they had a regular security team that functioned very much in this monolith. We're gonna, you know, um, we're gonna build some software. We're gonna do a huge QA cycle. We're gonna do a bunch of security and then we're gonna deploy, right? We're gonna throw it over the wall. And then the group I was going into was, there's lots of applications, not one or two. Every application has its own deployment cycle, which is as soon as somebody writes some code and it passes the test, it's in prod, right? Like they're doing CICD. And so the, these models don't really <laughs> work well together. Um, and so I had worked in environments where we had done both of these. And so I was asked to come in and start this security team. So, this was the basic to-do list that I was tasked with when I came in. Um, essentially, make it specific to that group, um, make it secure, and make it compliant. Because that smaller group, as part of being bought out, was gonna go into new markets and they had to comply with everything in the EU, they had to comply with everything in, in uh, particular verticals that they hadn't gone into before. So, hopefully all stuff that y'all recognize. So, Again, I had some, some measure of confidence, right? Going in, I'd done this kind of thing before, not really building a program, but I'd worked at a lot of companies, I'd seen how it worked. So I had you know, a reasonable measure of confidence, uh, but I came in and started getting the fire hose. So uh, you know, if you're gonna do this, you have to be humble because you don't know what you're doing, I promise. So the first week I came in and I started to look through a little bit of code. I promise I will stop the picture shortly. <laughs> but this is almost um, timeline specific. And then I uh, saw other things uh, that made me confused. I started looking at process documentation and for a traditional security model, moving into that model and seeing, well, there don't seem to be any security processes. This is just kind of, uh, you know, whatever I wanna do. So I got a little upset. Um, I lost some hair. That's actually a true story. Um, got very angry, started telling people I was not, uh, not happy about things going on, um, had some heart trouble, <laughs> best show ever. If you don't know the show, you should definitely go spend some time. This is the television show of my childhood, so. Um, and then I got sad. Um, and then I went on and told my wife. And then we had the first weekend. So, <clears throat> uh, I kinda had this view of my life, right? Like, the world is, is just terrible, right? I, what have I gotten myself into? Um, is my old company still accepting my calls? Like, you know, that kind of, it was like, oh my word. Um, but then, you know, you kind of sit down for a minute and talk it out and you, you have to understand that the business is running, right? They had money to pay your salary to get you. The business is functioning. Somehow, the attacker has not like crushed this company. It doesn't mean they're not gonna do it tomorrow, but this business has been running for 15 years without me. It's probably gonna run for a couple more days, right? Like uh, everything that I'm gonna go in, I can't go in and tell the business, you have to come to a full stop and solve all these problems, right? Uh, so uh, once you get over that a little bit. Um, so the cadence here, just to prep people, like get you ready. Um, we're gonna have eight of these quarters, um, so I'm gonna, not touch on every specific thing. If you do have something that I skip and you want me to talk about, uh, throw your hand up, uh, fairly informal. So we'll go through eight quarters of what I was trying to do, what I got done, and what I learned through going through that. Um, so at the beginning, I was just trying to get to know people. It was a short quarter, kind of I came in the middle of a quarter, and I wanted to do some onboarding training, just go through that and see what that was like. Um, getting to know people was great, and uh, the training was fine, but I thought a lot more of myself and I didn't get as much of the training done because I was meeting lots and lots and lots of people and trying to get to know what was going on. Um, <clears throat> so the, the important thing here for me was learning how their processes work, learning the people that are important. Uh, I would tend to posit three easy ways to find important people. One, find people who are brand new because their impressions of the world are fresh and they can tell you, you know, if they've been there less than six months, they're still pretty fresh. The other thing would, or number two would be find people who have uh, obscene amounts of institutional knowledge, people who have been there forever and they can tell you, 
Oh, this is why this thing is. Get to know those people, be friends. And then the third thing I did with every single person that I met with, I said, who should I make sure that I absolutely talk to? If I don't talk to anybody else, who should I talk to? Um, and those tend to be people that are either the institutional knowledge people or people that are um, kind of at a specific choke point. So in our environment, everybody said talk to tooling or talk to platform. Those were the, those were the key um, places where I could plug in and make security happen without affecting the world, right? Our feature teams, our particular layout was we have the infrastructure team, the platform and tooling teams, and then feature teams sitting on top of those. Those feature teams don't have control over the lower layers. So if I wanted to get base things done that apply to everybody, those were good teams to talk to. So Q2, when the stuff really started happening. Um, so again, I'm fairly technical. I thought, hey, you know, how hard can this be? I worked at a static analysis company. I should have this knocked out in a quarter, right? Like, I built a static analyzer. It's not that hard to install one and run one and make it work. Um, dynamic analysis, less so my world, but hey, I know Simon, right? Like, I can call him and he'll help me set up all the automation for Zap. That should be easy. I can knock it out. I know Jeremy. Dependency check was easy, right? Like, that was, a, that was an easy one. And then I got to fix that training thing that I didn't get done in Q1 because I was lazy. Um, so static analysis is, is actually pretty hard when you have dozens or hundreds of apps um, at a single time that you have to set up a, a platform for to make all that stuff work. Uh, it's necessary depending on your environment, right? There's a lot of conversations now where, uh, is anybody on like super modern stacks that are not supported by static analysis? All right, all right, so perfect. If you're not, you should do this. If you are, Sorry, we can talk later, we can come up with ideas. I have some thoughts. Uh, I'm fighting some of that same problem myself, so uh, let's work through it together. Um, the tooling companies are always necessarily gonna have lag, right? That's just the way it is. There's, there's fewer security pro product companies than there are development product companies, so, or language companies, frameworks. So um, it is what it is. For dynamic analysis, I got zero time to work on it. I didn't do well at all. Dependency analysis, um, if you're not doing this, this is super low hanging fruit. It's like a good way to get a good win with your developers. Go in, start running this tool. It's free, it's open source. There's plenty of commercial tools. I can make recommendations later. Um, but this is super cheap, super easy, doesn't kill your time. Um, <clears throat> and so low hanging fruit. And then updating training, it actually got worse than it was the quarter before because I found out there was more training sitting out there than I knew existed. So uh, the, the, the couple of things that I wanted to point out here, um, one is start an application inventory early. I'm gonna harp on this point later, so I won't belabor it here, but if you, if you, you have this problem. I don't care who you are, you have this problem, and there's not a great solution for it, unless you have mega, mega bucks. Um, tools may not be the right place to start. It worked okay for me, but I probably should have focused on other things earlier. All right, so um, this particular, <clears throat> particular quarter, um, I wanted to get some more stuff done. I had heard of this thing about champions programs. Everybody was saying these were great. I didn't know what they were. Um, so I went and started learning about those. And then we had to solve credential storage. So we had hard-coded passwords, keys everywhere, just like probably some of you. Um, so we had to solve those problems. Um, for us, Vault worked really well. Well, it's an open source tool. Um, I'm gonna point out uh, some blog posts about how we specifically built it. Um, and so uh, we liked it. Depending, this one particularly um, depends on your infrastructure, where you're at. If you're in the cloud, you're gonna build this differently. If you're in a data center, you're gonna build this differently. If you're on Amazon or GCE, you're gonna build this differently, or GCP, whatever they call it now. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but that's an important one. Right? There's commercial tools that solve this problem too, but that's an important one. Uh, and it's one that the tooling has matured enough now to where you can solve it, but it's not push button, right? Like it's, or turnkey. You can do it though, uh, it is possible. Dynamic analysis, this one, this one was great. Um, so we already had Selenium for QA testing and uh, through the Champions program in, in our environment, I just started talking to people about security and I noticed that the people when I was doing in-person security training with, the people who asked me questions afterward who, who were interested in it, those were the people that turned out to be our champions. Those were the people that in, were interested in security already. Um, so I just asked them, hey, do you wanna talk more? And we set up following conversations and, and um, I really got a lot of lift actually from talking about just normal people security stuff. So 
how do you keep your web browser secure? How do you help your friends and family when you go home for Thanksgiving and they're asking you to fix their computer? How do you do these basic things? And so uh, by talking about those types of things that didn't really necessarily have to do with work, uh, I found people who were friends of security. And so that was really helpful. One of them was a QA person. He got really interested. He wanted to move into the dev side. And I said, well, if you have time, can you work on this? He did this in his part time, um, kind of his 20% work. He set up all the Zap stuff. I hooked him up with Simon. He set up all the Zap stuff, all the automation, and in a quarter got done what I couldn't do in two, right? Because he already knew where everything was. Everything worked out great. So make QA your friend. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about this more at the end, but if you're going to use open source, please get back in some way, shape, or form. It's really, really helpful to the community. And uh, giving back, there's lots of possibilities. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then the other thing here, um, uh, people in security I've found, most uh, people in security that you would want to work with are really, really generous with their time. Um, so you can find really smart people on Twitter, GitHub, wherever, and you can say, hey, you seem really smart about this. Would you mind talking to me for a little bit and answering my questions? And an hour conversation with somebody who's top of that field is invaluable, right? And they will do it. It's surprising. So I started doing this. Uh, in my particular case, um, there's a closed community called BSIM. Uh, there's a, has everybody heard of BSIM? Yes. All right, awesome. So there, it's a closed community. They put out papers that you can read for free and like a, a guide every year, um, which is really, really useful data. But the community itself, your company does have to buy in. My company does. Um, and so in that, I use this network really heavily. Um, Great people there, people doing this type of work, so that was helpful. All right, uh, moving right along. Time, 15, okay, we're good. Um, so I was looking at metrics this quarter, threat modeling, tracking attack surface, and then updating the SCLC. You'll notice some of these things kept moving quarters because I kept punting on these things because I just couldn't get enough work done. Uh, there's one of me. Um, so, I guess the important bits here were uh, threat modeling for me and then tracking attack surface. Um, threat modeling was, um, I, I took a really super lightweight approach and I said, hey, we're going to do stride dread because that's easy. There's tons of documentation. I don't have to teach everybody how to do it. Um, we did try some of those like little games, uh, elevation of privilege, if you've ever played that game. Um, it was not working with our developers. I'm sure that was more of a problem with me than anybody else. Um, but really just for my developers saying, these are the things I'm worried about, not those other things. So threat modeling, you know, like if you're building a web app, yes, you have to worry about the OWASP top 10. I am not concerned that you put that on a paper. I know you have to worry about that. I'm worried about that. Don't write that down. So really what we push for with threat modeling is, what are the things in your application that make your application unique? And then talk about those. So list those as risks. So yes, I know people who are threat modeling purists are gonna say that's a terrible way to approach it. It worked for us in this environment to get it in the door and our developers can spend a couple of hours doing it and not build this monstrous thing. We didn't have infrastructure. I mean, you know, we're not even using threat modeling tools. They're using whatever tools they can make a diagram with. And so I'm trying to make things as simple as possible for that group. So I require them to bring a picture with their data flow diagram or something where I can deduce what the data flow is, and then I require them to bring this list of threats. If they've done it three or four times, they can build that list themselves and I just vet it. If they haven't done it before, we sit in a room, we talk, talk it through, I kind of teach them the process and it works pretty well. Um, the other thing here, tracking attack surface. <clears throat> um, so the idea here is that, and I'll, I'll share a tool uh, later, in the, later in the talk, but the, the, the idea here is that I didn't, there were so many applications and they all exposed risk. They all had some measure of attack surface. I had no idea what the attack surface was for any of those applications. I didn't know, you know, uh, you got 10,000 lines of code. Is that 80 endpoints? Is that one endpoint? Like, I don't, I don't know what I'm actually tracking here. So this was a simple tool that, you know, essentially if you think about when an application starts up, it exposes its list of routes. It prints them out on the, you know, kind of the command line when you start up. We built something to kind of do this for a few frameworks that we support. Um, and I'll, I'll give you guys uh, an open source tool that you can kind of start with. Um, but the idea is basically we spit that information out um, and then we stuck it in a text file. And then we re use this really expensive proprietary tool called grep. 
um, and then diff, right, those really high price things. Um, we composed those together and said, all right, if we grep for certain keywords in URLs that are important, like if you have, um, I don't know, uh, customer, <laughs> something like that, we may want to pay attention and just make sure we know those uh, routes exist. We also said if you, if you pushed a change that was 100 lines of code, I'm not code reviewing every change that comes through, if you pushed a change that was 100 lines of code and didn't alter the attack surface at all, maybe that's less important than if you just pushed a change that was 50 lines of code but added three new routes. I may want to pay attention to that change more closely. Um, and so that, that's basically the way we use this tool to, to track diffs on the attack surface and, and keep track of them over time. Um, you can take this tool and use it for really fancy data, start looking at metrics over how things change over time. We haven't done that yet, but maybe we will in the future. Uh, but it's a pretty simple tool. Uh, yeah, I talked about all this, I think. Um, oh, one thing I didn't talk about. Uh, security talks about what's wrong quite a lot. So <laughs> most of our interactions with the, uh, anybody ever worked somewhere where security is viewed as like terrible, right? Everybody hates security, yep. Um, and that's what I had day one. It was really important to talk about how are we going to help you? How are we going to be proactive about this stuff? So that was really helpful in, in doing threat modeling because people like pretending to be the bad guy. Right? That's one, real, one thing I really picked up on. They like, oh, how could I break your stuff? How could I break my stuff? Uh, and it's not, not about calling your baby ugly or anything. It's just people enjoy kind of breaking out of their normal thing. Um, but then they get the chance to talk about, okay, Instead of me trying to break your stuff, how would I fix it? And, and then how do we push those controls down as much as we can? Right? I could solve it one time here, but can I push it in the platform team? And then that solves it for everybody. Um, so like with rate limiting. OK, so measuring um, for us, we, uh, so metrics are hard. There's, a, there's some good talks, and I, I'm going to do them injustice. There's some links to some good talks towards the end, and I would highly recommend that you read those instead of listening to what I'm saying or watch those because they're much, much, much better. Um, but metrics are just hard, and we're immature as a field. We don't know what to collect. Most people are going to start with how many volumes do you have, right? What did my tools spit out and say how bad your thing was? Um, we, we started there um, and said, um, what's the count of volumes? Do we see that changing and growing? Which kind of stinks because when you add a new tool, the number goes way up. It's not really helpful. Uh, things like um, uh, volume count against um, volume count against lines of code, um, basic things like cyclomatic complexity, like normal developer metrics we pulled in. Uh, and over time, we've added a few new metrics. Um, one is churn. So if we see a particular bit of code getting churned on a bunch, like why are you messing with that code so frequently? Uh, we were having a conversation yesterday about could we could we look at the age of code? That might be interesting. We have a unique uh, metric in our company that won't apply to you, but it is, is there code that exists that was written by the CEO when the company started? Because it's like it's a 20-year-old application and there's still some code out there. Uh, but we just basically have this rule for the security team, er, or for the security team to track through all the code that still has his name attached to it and then go get that rewritten. Like we, we filed tickets just to get old code rewritten. So the age of code, that kind of thing, um, is what we've tracked. However, some of the talks at the end are way better about metrics, and that's why I included them. I am by no means an expert there, and I just stole all their ideas. Um, so I remembered what I was going to say. One thing that I did with proactive controls is the conversation around service meshes, right? Like they're, they're really helpful. They're complex operationally, but they're really helpful. One of the things that we got was we kind of have um, sidecars, and so we got the benefit of all of our applications at some point are going to need some basic like rate limiting. Well, that's now a platform concern. That's not an application concern. Before we had certain applications that were having to build in rate limiting and like, why do you want to manage that code? That is not code an application should have to manage. We can push that in the platform. So any, we, we try to push everything down that we can. How's everybody doing? We're good? Halfway there? Yep. All right, so how do we do so far? Um, champions were really good. Uh, securing everything is like eh. Um, compliance, we had only started a little bit at this point, and then uh, one other thing was to try to take the lessons we learned and push them back up to the mo mothership. So, eh, doing okay. All right, so this is the point where we got acquired, and we started talking about a lot more um, different things because the company was maturing a little bit. So, um, I'll try to talk on 
three of these things. I think I'm doing okay on time. <coughs> uh, so we build an app, app deployment tool. I'm not gonna, not gonna go through that all together, but there's a couple links in a minute that you can go read uh, the blog post. By the way, these slides are already posted to the site, or you can ping me later if you want. Um, we were doing greenfield containers, which was really helpful. We were already doing this for infrastructure stuff. We already had containers in-house, but we weren't deploying our own apps on containers. We were just using it kind of in the trial run inside. So uh, we got a lot of lift there. And then runtime intelligence, which is kind of the app sensor stuff. So uh, I'll talk about a few of those. The deployment team, our tooling team, was fantastic. They did a lot of things. They asked me, what do you want from security's perspective? We'll do it for you. Uh, so they did all that. I wrote some code in there. Um, and the thing that I you know, learned the most out of this is the platform defaults matter. Um, so if you can make the, the easy way the, the secure way, then you get lots and lots and lots of wins. If you can just say, if you do it this way, um, this is your paved path, <laughs> then you get a lot of wins. So for containers, um, essentially this was a, it, the timing worked out really well. This was about the time that um, Aaron Gratafiori, I'm sure I'm butchering his last names, uh, like, Bible on container security came out. It's 130 pages or so. I was like a mad scientist reading through that, trying to figure out everything that it was saying. And out of that, I, I put together a list of about, I think, eight or 10 things that I wanted our team to do when we went to run containers. And I took that to the team. Uh, they gave me about a month to kind of give them feedback on the plan. I took that to the team and I said, this is the things that I want. Six of those they looked at and went, Okay, that doesn't matter to us, that's easy, that's fine. Two or three, they, were, they went, I don't think we can do that. And I said, well, why can't we do it? And so we had that conversation, we went back and forth, and they, they took two of them and said, okay, we'll do that. And then the last one they said, if you want that, you have to do it yourself. So I went in and fussed with their stuff and actually got it to work. However, uh, the payback on that was tremendous because now we have base, um, you know, app armor policies, set comp profiles, we run read-only containers, like all these things that are, just make security so much better by default. That's the paved path. If anybody inside the company wants to go around that, they have to get exceptions. Not from me, from the tooling team, because they have to explain to the tooling team why they can't run on the base platform. So look for places that are infrastructure related that everybody depends on, those choke points, and start trying to apply security there. It's really helpful. Um, for runtime intelligence, yeah, it kind of worked. Um, I got a few teams to buy in, but essentially the idea here is more, like everybody knows what uh, fraud detection is. If you think about fraud detection, you use your credit card in a weird place, somebody calls you and says, that's unusual. Uh, so this is the idea here. Um, and so I'm somewhat pitching app sensor, but really just the idea. Your application, <clears throat> If you're, you know, I worked in banks for a while. So if you, if you log into an application, an uh, online banking application, you have a list of accounts, right? And you click on your account and you go view the detail for that checking account or whatever it is. Um, that's all fine and good. Hopefully you get authorization checks and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you go to an account that's not yours, right? You own one, two, three, and you try to go to five, five, seven, right? And that's not yours. There's two possible, essentially two, two possibilities. Either the application exposed a link to you that it shouldn't have exposed and you clicked on that thing, right? They showed you 557 and you clicked on it, in which case the app is broken, or you are trying to mess with something, right? You are trying to probe and break something, in which case you should wanna know. So essentially those two, those are, those are the two possibilities. So that's the idea behind runtime intelligence or what I call runtime intelligence is track those things when exceptional conditions occur that are out of the norm, keep track of those things. They may be benign, they may be for real. But if somebody has like 40 of those in a couple minutes, it's probably for real. And so that's, that's the basic idea. So we started having things like, I started asking questions during threat modeling and saying, what would not make sense, right? If you're, if you're doing shopping and checkout and you go through and you add something to your cart and you enter your address and whatever, and then you enter your credit card number. You're on like step four. Would it ever make sense for somebody to start at step four? No, of course not, right? That's not normal, unless you're a carter, in which case you start at step four. So if you start to get your developers to think about what, how could somebody jump around in your application? How could somebody um, misuse the application? And would this ever make sense? 
then they can start to tell you how their business, you, you better learn how the business works, but you also get your developers to think about, you know, um, uh, ways, that, ways that attackers may break it. The two most helpful things I've found here are if you look for exceptions or errors or whatever you call it in your language, exceptional conditions are almost necessarily fit in this bucket and then if, out of threat modeling, if you look at abuse cases, those are really good places to start. Yes. Can you elaborate on the, uh, what this effort makes sense? Because one issue I've run into is I'll, I'll find stuff that I think is an issue, I'll tell the developer and they're just like, nobody says we're going to do that, why, why should I fix that? Is that what you're talking about on the, would this ever make sense, or um, something else? So when I say, um, so in the banking account example, right, um, the, the way that you would get to an account you don't own is the system's broken or an attacker goes in there, right? So that's a pretty easy sales pitch to make. There may be something in your business where it's, it's a ridiculous thing to even think of, um, but having said that, attackers like those types of things. Um, but I'm not asking for a huge amount of work on the developer's part here. Essentially, my suggestion would, and there's some commercial tools that will do this kind of thing for you depending on your framework, uh, language and framework. But essentially, if you have to roll your own, the ask is in an exceptional condition, add a line of code that says send event. And then you keep something on the back end that just tracks events. For, for the sake of conversation, it could be just logging. Right, log, add a log line that says such and such happened. And then if you structure your log line in a specific way, you as a security person could come on the back end, parse the log file, find all of those events, and then start crunching on them. Uh, that's a really easy way that most developers are not gonna hopefully complain about too much, add a line, a log line here. Um, it can get more complex, but for me, in our environment, um, like one example I gave uh, uh, kind of relevant to rate limiting was I said, <clears throat> okay, you have a front end service here. This is exposed to the world and you haven't put authentication on it because, well, in, the, in this particular case, it made sense, right? Like I know that sounds terrifying, but in this particular case, it made sense. So I said, well, wh you know, what does the usage pattern look like? What does the standard, you know, your kind of histogram look like? And he said, well, most users are gonna hit this twice a day, but every once in a while, we'll get like 10,000 requests a second. What, like how, what? <laughs> 10,000 a second, what happened? And they said, well, we see that and we just like dropped the request on the floor. And I said, how? And they had a little simple, if, you know, they were keeping a little simple uh, cached map of users and request count per second or something like that. And once they started seeing it go crazy, they started dropping requests. Alert on that. We know that that's a bad person. Nobody's sending, sorry, nobody's sending 10,000 requests per second and is legit, right? Like, that's, that's not okay. So it's, it's usually finding out just stupid, hinky things like that. Um, and to me, you're kind of building guardrails for your application. You're saying outside these bounds, right? Like, to me, I'm, I'm way more interested in just closing off whole problem sets. <laughs> like, I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, because, you know, honestly, as a field, we really stink at this runtime intelligence. If I, ha if I had to venture a guess, probably I could ask most of you, how many, could you tell me in 30 seconds or less with some dashboard that you own, how many users are active on your site right now? Like, that's a super basic question. I bet most of you couldn't tell me, right, if you're kind of like the normal group. Uh, if I had to ask how much, um, how many transactions are going on, right? Like, you probably have to do some work to find that out. You might could find it out, but you probably don't have it handy. So we don't really know how our applications are used in general, much less how they're being attacked. Um, so there's some people kind of playing in this space commercially, um, and we can talk later if you want. Um, so we found out Vault is really super useful. Um, I'm not a salesman for Vault, but I really do like it. It's got a lot of uh, clever features in there that are really helpful. Um, <clears throat> this, this is one thing that I genuinely believe here. AppSec and OpSec is a really, really, really ripe area for innovation. So just talking to your ops people, you can get a lot of data, and you can start using that data to inform your practice. So the, the basic idea of you know, we're spending all our AppSec investment solving this problem, and then the ops people are going, that's not a problem. <laughs> like, we never see that. I'm not suggesting you let the tail wag the dog. I'm saying you can run a more data-driven program if you want to. Uh, and so these people are, are, these are the people that can answer most of the questions that would, that would help drive that. Um, so most of this work was not mine, uh, but it's really clever. So if you want to go grab those, uh, read about what we use, how we use Vault for safe deployment. 
um, those are, are really good write-ups. And if you have further questions, I'm, I'm certainly more than happy to talk to you about it. The tools are not open sourced or released. Uh, they are internal proprietary tools, but all the ideas behind the tools are there. Um, and like if you're in AWS or GCP, uh, you could probably pull it off with less tooling than we had to write internally. Okay, uh, moving right along probably much more quickly now. Uh, so core security libraries, this was something that should have came up way, way, way sooner. And then um, secure code attestation, um, or source code attestation, sorry. Uh, so core security libraries, we as a team kind of uh, moved from, we want to solve vulnerabilities to we want to solve vulnerability classes. Part of that was just my maturing. But uh, this is the way I believe to do it, building core security libraries. So if you have, again, we have platform and infrastructure, infrastructure teams that were really core to our environment. So if I solved a problem at the platform layer uh, or at the library layer and nobody else had to solve that problem, that's a win, right? If we've squashed whole Vuln classes, there's a really good talk from uh, Christoph Kern at Google that I link to later uh, to go see how they did it. And when you think about the manpower at Google for Developers, I don't, I don't know how many man years they have, you know, 25, or it's upwards of that now, 25,000. Um, they spent 11, I think it was 11 man months or something like that uh, to build a uh, SQL injection prevention library. And they just squashed SQL injection. Like you can't write SQL injection in Google at all. Now, it's a little different situation than most of us because well, they own the database. <laughs> and so they write the dri driver for their database. So not all, all of us have that. But it's really clever work. Um, there's, a, there's a research paper about how they did it. So um, a good one. The other thing we've learned here is um, we're trying to make the move from uh, most of the tooling categories are find the bad. We're trying to make the move to, to you tell me what's good and then show me what deviates from good. Right. So an example of that would be, um, Okay, you, you've got SQL injection issues, right? Lots of tools will tell you you've got SQL injection. You might have it in your RM layer, you might have it in direct database access, you might have it, whatever. Um, that's fine, but most of the tools are gonna be okay if no matter what tool you're using if you don't have SQL injection. So to flip that a little bit, you might choose, um, you know, we choose this one specific ORM. That's the way we want you to inter interact with the database. And then the rule would essentially be, if you're using this ORM, good, you're, you're good on SQL injection, but if you're using that ORM, you may be okay on SQL injection, but it doesn't meet our policy. Stop using that ORM, move to the core layer. Does everybody, does that make sense, right? We, we're channeling people down a path. Um, so, you know, people from Netflix probably argue with that because <laughs> the freedom responsibility thing. But we found that making a paved path that's easier, that we don't give people 17 ways to do something, it just makes it much simpler for our team to scale. Um, source code attestation, you do kind of have to have, uh, put a little work in here because you don't get this for free in most places. But essentially what I mean here is, I want to know that the person who wrote the code signed the code, so they have signed commits. And I want to know that the person who, I, I want to know that we had two code reviewers that came in and I can authenticate who those two, two code reviewers were and I have strong uh, verification there. And then I want to be ensured that uh, the code went through our CI system and our controls. And then I want to be ensured that the code got pushed to the place where I meant for it to be pushed. And then I want to know that that code that's running is the same code that came from this commit. I want to be able to trace it all the way through. So, you know, um, there's a few things you have to do there, uh, but we, we went through the effort um, and it's, you know, it's handy. All right, so I think I talked about that. Uh, I should have started killing bug classes a lot sooner. Uh, I should have started with hooks a lot sooner. Um, let's see, what do I talk about here? Uh, immutable infra and fast slow check. So immutable infra is really killer. Um, so if you can get to uh, where you move from like um, configuration management tools, the Puppet Chef, Ansible Salt, to um, kind of the Terraform cloud formation tools, where you can say um, via, con um, uh, via policy configuration, this is what I want my environment to look like then you can't change that thing. The, the tool is responsible for updating that thing for you. Or if you say that, you know, um, Square, uh, their Docker lead, uh, or Docker's, uh, not Square, it was at Square and then he went to Docker. Uh, Diego, Diogo Monica, he has a talk about reverse uptime where, okay, I'm running a container, but I wanna make sure that my containers at most are 
three days old or something, right? Like it used to be a badge of honor that you'd been running a Linux system for 11 years. That is not a badge of honor. Turn that thing off and like, you know, <laughs> update it. The newer thing that most uh, interesting thing um, is, and I think Netflix is down to like eight hours or something. Um, so if you have stateless containers, if you have stateless systems, who cares if you kill them? And that really helps from like, if an attacker gets into your network, and they're sitting on a box, and that box goes away six hours later, like they gotta be quick. They gotta really move laterally quickly. Um, and if the infrastructure is constantly changing, um, you, you get help. And when things go back through the system, any patches, any whatever, you know, the next time it runs through a build, you should, you should constantly be getting more and more secure. Uh, we were able to successfully check off the boxes for compliance. If you have a compliance-driven uh, program, I am very sorry. Uh, I feel your pain, um, but I, I do think that security should, in general, be able to check the compliance boxes without much trouble. Uh, we also moved to fast, slow check model where we have a synchronous, asynchronous thing in our pipeline where the, the, you know, all the slow tools <laughs> run asynchronously and we've kind of come around on the tail end and, and close the loop. But we got some lift from just doing basic things in CI that are really, really, really fast. Um, you know, a friend of mine calls it the Grepmaster 5000. So really, really fast checks that say, uh, somebody was talking about uh, the React um, API, what is it, uh, dangerous, set dangerous enter HTML or something like that. Well, if you have a policy that you can't do that, that's a, that's a grep rule. <laughs> like, add that to your thing and then if somebody pushes a commit that has that, block the commit, right? That's super fast, super easy, uh, and you get a good win. We've, we've started building up that list as much as we can because at the end of the day, what you get out of that is, okay, maybe you're not doing real deal security analysis, but it's kind of that you must be this tall to ride type conversation. At least I know that you don't have these problems. Uh, so we got some wins there. Oh, sorry, moved too quickly. Uh, yeah, I think we did all that. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about here is app portfolio. So collecting all this stuff into a single consistent view. I have no good answer for you here. Um, it's terrible. It's a nightmare, and almost everybody has this problem. Uh, so I was talking with Jack about this yesterday. Uh, at, at a minimum, you have three areas of problems. You have what does the world see from the outside? Then you have what do you see from your development environment, your CI systems and that kind of thing? And then you have what do you see operationally? Like what does my operational environment actually look like? There's no good answers that I'm aware of for any of those three, and then trying to compose those three together so you get a holistic view Good luck. But, you know, I, I saw a, somebody mention something this morning, some company got breached and the, they had fixed this issue on a lot of their sites, but the reason they got breached on that site is they didn't know they own this site. Right, when you're, when you're a big company, right, like Oracle for instance, I mean, I, I actually don't know the answer to this, but I would posit that Oracle owns tens of thousands of sites. That's tens of thousands of applications, right? Uh, I know Oracle publicly has 3,000 public applications that they offer. That's ridiculous, you know? Like, how do you keep track of all that? And they're done by different teams in different places, different technology stacks, different, um, you know, VCS systems, different CI systems. Like, how, how do you keep track of all that? It's a really super hard problem. So if anybody's looking for an area to disrupt and make tons of money, that's a good one. Um, all right, so. Moving quickly now. Uh, yeah, we did all right. Um, not great, not perfect, but we did all right. Okay, so what do you do now? So these are all the things that I want you to uh, focus on. I'm gonna read each one of these very slowly. Everybody ready? No. Um, go read these later. Uh, I'll pick one or two. Um, so this I actually found incredibly useful, Security Planner, that made me a lot of friends because um, uh, People, people want to be able to help their family. People are interested in just general security. We talk about personal security. We do like lunch and learns and that kind of thing. And more people show up for personal security than they ever show up for anything AppSec related. So if you're talking about, you know, what's a YubiKey? People care. They're like, hey, I've heard about that thing. I saw it on the news. Can you teach me what it's for and how to use it? Um, what is two-factor auth? They will show up, right? And then you'll find people who are interested in security that you can kind of throw some, some work on and, and talk to them. Uh, also talking about privacy. Privacy is a huge issue with people nowadays. And if you kind of show that you care about them <laughs> personally 
uh, if you talk about privacy inside the application, people uh, usually respond pretty well. Um, and then save your no's. Please don't say no to everything. Say yes to most things or say we will work with you to figure out how to say yes. Then when you say no, it, it actually matters and they'll believe you. Uh, so let's see, this was people related things. I think uh, process related things. Um, I think you know, looking for, for choke points would be probably the most um, useful thing I can say. Find places where you can, uh, find places where uh, it's gonna affect as many things as possible. Put your, put your level of effort there. Uh, work on self-service, nobody, everybody would prefer to, you know, uh, my boss calls this the difference between like the security uh, bank model and the security ATM model. How many of you go into the bank to get money anymore, right? Like most people are gonna prefer self-service. Even if they like you, they don't wanna to talk to you, right? Like they'd rather do it fast, they'd rather do it on their timetable, so invest here. And then um, collect data. So I don't know what I don't know, so we just collect a bunch of data and we start looking at it later. We start collecting as quickly as we can and then look at it later. Um, and then lastly, uh, on the technology side, of, I've talked about most of these, but spend time on big things. So all of us are limited by people on the security team. There are things that matter more than other things. So 2FA is gonna get you way further than squashing 37 XSS bugs, right? Like spend your time on the things that matter. Um, so, so focus on those. And, and the big things may be different for you, I don't know, but spend time on the things that matter for you. Um, okay, homework. So for metrics here, there's a couple of really good talks. Um, this one I really, really, really like, uh, and then here's, here's a couple of them. Um, there's some other good, excuse me, there's some other good talks in there. Uh, Christoph Kern is there. There's a, there's a whole uh, series on Medium from Ryan McGann, who is a thousand times smarter than I am, that you should read about starting, doing, it, uh, doing security at startups. So he's got some really good stuff there. All right, almost done. Um, so everybody knows this I believe, yes? No? Okay. So you should go read this on your personal time anyway. Really good book, really good series. It was done back in the 50s, 60s. And they would bring on these famous people and they would say, talk about one thing that you believe to your core, right? Um, so these things are way more important than what I'm about to <laughs> talk about. But these are, the, these are the five things that I want you to take away. Uh, you can't do AppSec if you can't code. Um, I don't mean that as a blanket statement, but I really do. You, you kind of have to say you don't really mean it because I don't want to offend people, but genuinely, learn how to code, hire people who can code. We do a lot better by hiring developers than we do security people and then turning them into security people. Um, may or may not work for you, but uh, nowadays, if you're gonna do this in a DevOps shop, they're not gonna wait around for you to just say, it's wrong, like you have to be able to help them fix it. Uh, we don't scale, so build a champions program. Look at detection and response, not just prevention. Uh, this, this goes to the we tell everybody this is the right way to do it, but how do we know that's true if we never look, right? How do we know if people are being successful attacking us? You don't want the way that you detect uh, problems in your code to be, hey, I hacked you, like, and now I'm, you know, I've got your site and give me Bitcoin. That's not appropriate detection and response. Build something yourself so you can find out yourself. Uh, bug bounties would fall in this category, maybe. Um, uh, some of these things matter more than others. You can't secure what you don't know, so build an inventory or at least try to. Uh, almost there, I promise. Uh, and then to the open source thing, please, please give back. We don't have to all write code uh, in open source. There's tons of things. One thing that I would hugely benefit from is if you just tell stories. So if you write blog posts about what you've learned, what was hard, that's incredibly valuable to the community. You can QA things, you can do docs, you can whatever, right? Like whatever you your skill set is, please contribute it. Um, so in the interest of that, we're gonna talk about a few tools and I'll go super quick through these because we're almost on time. Um, so MANA, this is a tool that I wrote. This is basically a uh, static analysis for GitHub PRs um, that does one rule. You're all welcome, one rule. It'll only solve one problem. Um, so this is the rule that it solves. Uh, so we laugh, but I used to work for a product company and I wrote this rule into a static analyzer and it found like, I don't know, 300 of these instances across our customers' code bases. 17 or 19 of them were um, if user equals admin. So if you don't know how this evaluates, 
the user equals out admin always evaluates the true because it's an assignment statement, not a comparison, right? So user equals admin, so this block was always being processed. And so we found 19 of those across our customer base, and that was you know, limited across industry. So I know this exists out there, and I know there's some bad usages. So this is one rule. Um, so if you, if you go plug this thing in, this, it exists. I'll give you the link in a minute. If you go plug this thing in, it'll find that rule and solve it for you. And if, even though this is tiny, right, even though this is super little, if you think about, if you could solve this one problem across every project on GitHub, like what the scale be? So if anybody here works for GitHub, please go build this much better than I did. Uh, it would be awesome. They're doing some great stuff like this, right, for third-party libraries. They're giving you solutions here. Um, and, and I honestly think that's where we should move. Uh, second one, the attack surface analyzer. This is the output of it. Um, so we have some, essentially we have some routes. Uh, we'll tell you the parameters, uh, other routes, blah, 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 right? So this is what the output looks like. This is the way that I use it. Um, so I take the routes, I pull out the things that I care about, and then I can diff this over time, right? I can see that, okay, you added a new route, this is the thing. You can pull the parameters if you want. Um, so we use, I should mention, we use this to feed into our DAS scanners. So I feed this into the pen test team. I'll run a scan and this will help them like get breadth coverage. This will give them a starting place so they know what all the routes are. Their people can poke through the parameters that they see, right? Like you'll find a lot of times in here, you'll find like an admin flag or a, you know, QA flag or something, some bit that somebody, some developer put in, oh, I want to test this thing. Like, and you're never going to see that as a, as a pen tester unless you, you know, were to know about that flag or you try a certain flag. So um, that's pretty helpful for me. I can diff this thing, I can grep this data um, and store it over time and see interesting stuff. The other thing, this is a little bit different. Um, so I'm gonna give you like 30 second problem that I had. Third party library analyzer, uh, the way this is important, not necessarily for our DevOps team, but for our bigger team, which is we have like, um, we have a base infrastructure team, then a platform team, then a tooling team, and then we have a bunch of feature teams. Well, these teams on the bottom may be using a library and that may be out of date or may have a CVE or whatever, and we need to patch that. But I need to tell these teams up here that that library's been patched because they depend on this, this um, platform API or platform library. Um, but that one's been changed from under the covers. And if, they're, if their test cases don't cover that bug and their, their functionality does, then who knows, right? We may be breaking things throughout the stack. So what I had to do was figure out, okay, anytime I touch a single library and I need to propagate that through, I need to tell people. Um, so there's not really any tooling that exists, so this is what we built. Um, this is from uh, WebGoat, right? Uh, so what, it, what it'll give you is this. It'll say, this class depends on this, and it'll go a few layers deep, I think five or six by default. It, it can go as deep as you want. This class depends on this, depends on this. And this thing, is presumably in a jar that's getting patched, a, a jar that's getting updated. Um, this is the JSON equivalent of what you just saw. And then we did some visualization here. So this one's hard to talk to. <laughs> um, but essentially, if you look up in the top left, I know it's an eye test, but it's pretty. So uh, this is the user classes that depend on, um, so we, we are learning here. This is a new project, we are learning. These are the user classes that depend on this, that depend on this, right? Like you see all these fuzzy little lines that are connecting. Um, this is kind of how WebGoat is related to itself. So whatever this library is, I guess Spring Security Config, depends on whatever this library is, which is Spring Security Web, which kind of makes sense, right? So these are not directional arrows yet, but presumably there's some connections here that matter. Um, the other thing that's really handy is like this. Like I don't know what this is. Uh, it's on a different page, I guess, or I don't know. Anyway, uh, whatever this is, it is loosely coupled, right? It has one little line going to one thing that's also somewhat loosely coupled. So, uh, and, and sometimes you'll just find a little circle that doesn't have any connections. That means that library is not being used at all. Uh, but sometimes you'll find something like this. To me, what this says is you're using a library, but you're only using like it one time. Uh, so maybe, depending on the license, we might go to this library, rip out whatever that function is that's being used. Usually this will be like a utility library. Like this might be you know, common CSV. We may go rip out that function, pull it into our source code tree, and then get rid of the library and never have to patch that thing again, right? Like, um, 
because we want to reduce attack surface as much as possible. That may or may not make sense to you um, in your context, but for us it does sometimes. So these are the links to those things. Uh, please go tell us how they are terrible. Please go like uh, break them, use them, whatever, it'd be fine. Uh, ask for features, all that kind of stuff. So we all have something to contribute. Here's some examples that I really like in different areas, docs, talks, scripts, code, organization, uh, general work. Like this thing was fantastic. The uh, paper that was written, and you know, this was from a consulting group that did a bunch of research and then just published it with the world. I can't tell you how many people uh, have benefited from that work and how much it's launched. Uh, so I believe you can do this. Uh, some homework. We already talked about all these. Uh, so it's, it's tough to say goodbye. That's for my kids, and that one's for me.